time, first uh, speaker series you've ever been to. Awesome, some first, uh, some first timers out there, good. Glad to see you here, thanks for coming. We hope that you uh, continue to join us. Uh, f- every third Thursday of the month, we have the speaker series. Uh, where we always have somebody come in and talk about their uh, time uh, and their adventure into flying, and it varies from all over the spectrum of flying warbirds, home built hot air balloons. If it flies, it's fair game. So, um, the uh, before I, I forget, uh, we do have uh, uh, aircraft open in the uh, uh, Eagle hangar that you can go and do a cockpit climb on afterwards. Uh, we also have some artifacts. Uh, Sean's the first guest I ever had who uh, actually came on and brought his own ordinance with him. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, I didn't know it was out here earlier. Somebody told me, don't bomb tonight. And uh, I had no idea what they were talking about, and I came out and found that out here. So um, we also have a tire uh, straight back there by one of the pillars. That's a, t- a type of tire that the, the 17 and the 29 would use. So make sure you check that out. And would it still do? Still, that's true. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, don't be too rough on it. That has to go back on the airplane. So <laughs> um, we have a great lineup, though, uh, coming up a- uh, after this as well. We have people uh, ranging from... Uh, A-10 pilots, who's our next uh, speaker next month, Kim Campbell, who uh, flew her A-10 home, uh, battle damaged, and manually landed it. Um, Again, a really exciting lineup. Uh, Take a look on the Facebook page, on the website, uh, and uh, and continue to join us. We also have a movie series the first Thursday of every month where we do uh, different documentaries and films. We used to show some older films. We switched it up to documentaries. That's actually kind of a lot of fun, too, because a lot of these people are EA members, so they're... uh, sharing their work, uh, their art with us, so we appreciate it. Um, but tonight, we're going to talk about B-29 Super Fortresses. Really different for me, because I'm a B-17 nerd, so I've actually had to go into the books and learn some stuff to, to be able to hang out with Sean up here. Um, I'm very honored to, to share the stage up here with our Vice President of Advocacy and Safety, Sean Elliott, who uh, not only is on staff with us here Monday through Friday, fighting the good fight uh, to keep uh, aviation uh, safe and, and free for everybody, but also to continue to keep these warbirds going, continue that uh, the, the living uh, history uh, that these aircraft do. But Sean also as well flies a lot of these, these historic warbirds, and uh, so no better person to come up here and share the stage and talk uh, about what it's actually like to be in the cockpit. So I'll share some of the background and history and the veteran experiences. Sean's going to talk about what it's like to actually strap on some of these airplanes and go flying. Before we do, Sean, I think we have somebody uh, special in the audience tonight. We really do, Chris. These programs are, are amazing. And <clears throat> thank you all for coming out tonight, as Chris said. But in the audience tonight, we're very, very honored. We actually have an, a, an authentic B-29 aircraft commander and flew 20-plus missions. Uh, Don Wilkinson, uh, Don's son brought him out. He's from Green Bay, 98 years old. Can we all give Don a round of applause? <laughs> I told him that uh, whenever he hears something that's not right, please uh, qu- feel free to correct me, because uh, he, he's the real deal. He, he went out and did this for real and uh, uh, represented and, and fought for this country uh, like the greatest generation did in these really challenging airplanes in many respects. So we're, we're very fortunate to have him here tonight. Again, thank you, and thank you for your service, sir. Um, all right, well, let's go ahead and start talking uh, the B-29. Of course, the B-17 is my first love, as I'm so sure uh, Sean's is as well. Um, so a couple of hero shots. That's my hero shot. That's it. That's as good as it gets, guys. So, uh, uh, and Sean, there's some of the aircraft you've flown. Yeah, the 17 is absolutely my favorite. I have to admit, I've been flying the B-17 now for almost 20 years. Uh, started in 2001. And it's like my favorite old sweater. I put it on and it just feels right. Uh, still to this day, I'm, I'm an instructor, an examiner. I do type ratings uh, as a specialty aircraft examiner in the 17, and I do most, if not all, of the crew training for aluminum overcast. And it's, it's a real special machine. But it also has given me that, that wonderful perspective of what was it like for these young air crews to go in 44 and 45 and take that same feeling. You know, here's an aircraft commander that came back from perhaps flying combat in Europe, um, and had flown the 17 and had brought him home successfully and survived, you know, thick and thin uh, with, with his crew of, you know, 10 guys. Uh, and then wound up transitioning to the Super Fortress. And I've had, obviously, some of those same emotions. And I'm going to try to do my best to share that here tonight. I've been flying Doc now for just under three years. 
So I'm relatively new to the airplane. I certainly by no means am an expert in B-29s, but I do have a, a new level of appreciation of, of the evolution of Boeing bombers, and particularly how this magnificent, what uh, my son and I call the machine, uh, the B-29, really means uh, to you know, aviation history in the Army Air Force. So we'll try to reflect some of that tonight and hopefully make it fun. I also love that your uh, your resume includes the Spear of St. Louis. There's not a lot of people that can uh, can add that to the list of aircraft they've flown. That's pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's we've, we're very blessed at EA. We we fly. We're a flying organization. We believe that uh, it's important to see these airplanes where they belong in the sky, and certainly uh, it's a pretty neat and eclectic uh, grouping of airplanes that I've had the privilege to be able to act as PIC in. Uh, that's awesome. That's uh, it's a, a lot of fun to see them uh, come to life here. So talk about the, uh, the start of the B-29, which I had to sneak a B-17 clip in. Um, but basically, uh, you know, 1935, Boeing built the 299, which became the B-17. And they did that out of pocket. That prototype was built from their own shareholders. Um, the airplane, of course, became the B-17. Uh, the United States Army Air Corps, which existed at that time, said that the airplane looked like it was really well suited for, for the fight in Europe. But they had some, some concerns about whether it would be able to strike everywhere they would want to strike uh, if a war broke out in the Pacific. Uh, so Boeing went, again, back to their own drawing board on their own dime and built a mock-up and one flyable example of a new airplane to meet a demand that the Air Corps put out for a super bomber. And they built the XB-29, which is what you see there. Um, the Air Corps showed enough interest in it that they actually funded uh, a third airframe or second flyable airframe uh, to continue into further testing. And uh, so at that time, there were two XB-29s, uh, I guess an XB and maybe a YB-29 or so. And um, there's a cool shot of the, some of the first ones. Believe it or not, a lot of people who know B-29s, uh, it's kind of interesting to see them in the olive drab and uh, gray paint scheme that you sort of associate with a B-17 or even some of the early B-24s. Um, but at this time, and I know Sean's going to talk about this here in a second, Building the B-29, this aircraft was one of the most advanced airplanes and weapons, period, to be conducted and built out of World War II. Uh, um, Sean, I know this is a slide you were going to talk about here. Yeah, it was, it, it's telling to me. When you look at uh, the B-29 program overall, as Chris said, it was a massive undertaking. They literally spent more on developing the airplane than they did the atomic weapon that ultimately ended World War II. Um, but when you understand, you know, the perspective of, you know, say a, a young uh, farm kid uh, entering, uh, you know, the war and being trained, here is the, the, what, what to that individual, young, young individual, would have seemed like Star Wars level technology with the E-Model B-17 and the introduction of the Sperry man turret. Uh, to a young kid, this, this had to have been, you know, futuristic kind of stuff. And literally to go from a, a person inside, which I've actually sat inside our Sperry turret and operated it without the guns, thankfully. That's the way I fit. Um, but nonetheless, it really is leading edge. I mean, it's hydraulic. It's, it's, it's fairly um, progressive in the way you can actuate it. You've got foot pedals to move the axis, and then you've got a, a hand mechanism to move the vertical axis. And you can go really slow, or you can go as fast as almost 360 degrees in two seconds. So it's a pretty sophisticated piece of machinery. And it will hurt you if you're not careful. It's, it's something to, to be respected and understood. But imagine going from that, which was very much you know, 1940, 1941 technology, within just two years, by 1942, Chris, next slide, to this, pressurized, heated, single point axis where you have a, a master gunner looking outside of an observation dome controlling a gun sight that trains every one of the aircraft turrets on a single target. That's what a leap going from the development of the B-17 to the B-29 truly was. It had automation, it had sophistication, it had crew comfort, all of the things that the 17 was lacking, believe me, I've flown the 17 in some pretty cold weather. As cold as about 15 degrees above zero. And obviously up at altitude, it was as cold as 40 below. It's drafty. It, when you stand by the ball turret, the air is just shoving its way past that, the cracks and crannies. And you know it. I mean, it's freezing. Uh, the 29 is like an airliner as far as the, the comfort factor. The crews had a much different environment in which to uh, fly combat in. And building the airplane, of course, was also a challenge. Again, this was such an advanced airplane. It actually took four different factories 
uh, to build the airplane. Um, this is uh, one of the uh, factories in Kansas. Uh, they actually called it the Battle of Kansas. They were battling a nasty winter uh, trying to produce these aircraft. Um, but uh, let's see here. We have, uh, well, Sean, there's, uh, there's you in the same, uh, right, you're in the same area, right? Uh, actually, yeah. So when I, my very first uh, introduction to, uh, to DOC, I went out to, I was asked by the DOC organizers to, to become part of the inaugural crew, went out to Wichita. The airplane was being stored at McConnell Air Force Base. And it was in this original uh, World War II hangar that the airplane was actually being housed in by the Air Force. And uh, the interesting fact of this, there's Stu Dawson on the left. Stu flies Rare Bear at Reno, uh, flew the, the uh, Connie back uh, for Chino at the restoration. And he and I were doing, we were part of the crew getting checked out. Um, he and I are both examiners too. But the interesting thing is this hangar was literally right across the street from the original plant number two where the airplane was rolled out originally from, uh, from Boeing, Wichita as a brand new airplane. That's wild. And something we learned today, uh, and by the way, what an honor to get to ask to be part of that crew. I mean, that, uh, that's an amazing, you get to be an ambassador for an amazing aircraft. It was. It was uh, Charlie Tillman was the guy that called, who's the best and, and most prolific B-29 examiner uh, in the examiner corps. He said, hey, we're, we're reaching out a couple of you guys that are pretty seasoned B-17 guys. Would you be interested in, in joining up with Doc and learning to fly that airplane? It's like, don't ask me twice. <laughs> I will walk to Wichita <laughs> if I have to. <laughs> Well, and something we learned today is in Kansas, they had plant two. And in Seattle, they also had plant two. Uh, dumb luck uh, in the numbering of their buildings, but there were, there were two different plant twos. Uh, this is the one out in Seattle, Washington, of course, where the B-17s were built. Uh, this is tr sort of a changeover in production from the 17 to the 29. They had a ceremony. Uh, the B-17 says Berlin on the back, and the B-29 said Tokyo on the back. Um, something that they did that was pretty unique and, and something I think we ought to talk about is they were really worried about being bombed. They were worried about this factory being a target for the Japanese. So they built a fake city on top of it. And that's a picture of it from the air. Um, but let's talk about how elaborate they got with it. I mean, they actually put houses, uh, shrubs up top, trees. They actually had a few cars, and they would go out and move the cars at certain points in the day so it looked like you know, there was actually something going on. And then they wanted to, they were trying to figure out how to get plant workers up there to actually sort of make an actual city in case there was a high altitude spy plane, you know, flying around that uh, it would look like just part of a normal city. And that's exactly what they did. Those are Boeing workers on their lunch break, and they would just go up on the roof and, and relax and have lunch up there. So uh, uh, it had to be a pretty cool view from up there. So <laughs> Now, the, uh, some of the other plants that uh, uh, built them was, this is the, the plant out in Nebraska. Um, out that uh, that's a Martin built B twenty or B twenty nine, and Sean, you have a, a slide for this. I do. So when you were look look at there were four uh, major places that built the B twenty nine, and just under four thousand were, were in total produced. Wichita was the biggest uh, contributor to that. The Wichita plant built seventeen hundred and sixty nine airframes, forty four percent of the B twenty nine production. Uh, but then, uh, as you said, Chris, uh, Boeing built them out in Washington, uh, Renton. Uh, it was 1,100 or 11, 1,119 aircraft produced. Um, Bell Aircraft produced 668, and then Martin in Omaha built 536. Now, this compared to the B-17. So B-17, 12,731 airplanes built. But again, three companies. That's that's a big part of how the United States was so successful in World War II was the absolute qu quantity of production that this country was capable of. And, uh, you know, in the case of the 17, it was Boeing, Lockheed Vega, and Douglas all built the B-17 simultaneously. In the case of the B-29, it was uh, Boeing, Bell, and, and Martin. So uh, several years ago, we were um, putting on some replacement caps on our, our yoke for aluminum overcast. This is one of our spares. And this picture that you, you see behind me was put on the left yoke. And I looked at it and I went, Bell, why is Bell on, the, on a cap for a Boeing B-17? And I, nobody knew. I kept asking around and consulting various textbooks that I have in my library and I couldn't, couldn't find it. And then finally, I go to get checked out in dock. And I realized after studying the B-29, wait a minute, Bell built B-29s. The airplane has the same yoke. The B-29 and the B-17 yoke is identical. So that cap that is on our B-17 today is an imposter. <laughs> it's originally from a B-29 that was clearly produced in Marietta, Georgia. So 
the aviation archaeology. We're nerds. It's cool. I love it. By the way, I, I think, it, and some of you can correct me, but I believe after the war, I think the Bell plant got bought, bought, got bought by Preston Tucker, and that's where he built his cars. Oh, is that right? Remember, if you ever saw the movie Tucker, Tucker Torpedo was built in one of those uh, and hangers. I, I, it was a B-29 plant for sure. But here's some of the workers at the Omaha plant. Uh, this is the war effort was all-encompassing. So you worked around the clock, all hours, Christmas Eve and Christmas. Didn't uh, really matter for the war effort, I guess. And here's some workers taking a break and singing some Christmas carols on Christmas Eve, uh, night shift, 1944. So uh, pretty interesting. And then there's the Martin plant uh, assembly line. When do you just have to go back and take a couple of those off the assembly line, you know? Oh, just to get the props as spares. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, something that a lot of folks uh, didn't realize, and it was something that I sort of had to dive into again, too, was the B-29 was first deployed to Europe. Just one uh, went over to Europe, and it was actually part of a misinformation campaign. Uh, they sent it over there to fly around and, and the, kind of spread the rumor that this new super bomber was going to uh, uh, be flying over Berlin and everything like that, but there was never uh, a real intent to do that. It was just uh, to sort of drum up some, uh, some, some bad information. Um, We'll dive into the engines of the B-29 because that is as the production was starting to uh, progress along and the airplanes were starting to enter combat into the Pacific Theater. Um, I think this is a poignant uh, thing to talk about because there were some issues with the engines of the 29. Yeah, there really were. The, uh, the engine that was deployed on the B-29 was brand new and still in many respects it was experimental. It was the Wright R3350. It has a big, big motor, uh, th you know, 3,350 cubic inches, 18 cylinders, developing 2,200 horsepower. And they had a lot of, of uh, teething issues. The airplane would, or the engine would, would overheat. Uh, they had temperature problems. Uh, they would catch fire. Uh, oftentimes, they would leak either oil or fuel or both. Uh, unfortunately, it actually took the life of the chief Boeing test pilot, Eddie Allen, just a few short months after the prototype first took to the sky. In, in February of 1943, it resulted in a crash in Seattle. And there were like 20 people killed in a factory along with the, the full complement of the test crew. It was a real setback to the program uh, in the sense of a tragedy, but they, 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 they soldiered on and they kept uh, moving the program forward. And there was some, uh, among some of the early crews, um, there was some hesitation to sign up to go fly the 29. Uh, there was a little bit of, there was a little bit of, of uh, I guess, some worried, some worried faces in that program. And they were trying to figure out what to do to come up with uh, an idea to, to sort of, reinvest, uh, I guess, interest or, or, or a trust in the aircraft. And uh, Hap Arnold came up with an idea uh, that what if we got a group of WASP, women pilots, to take a B-29 and fly it around the country to the different bases to show off that, well, if women could fly it, certainly you brave men could fly it, right? Uh, and that's exactly what they did. And as a matter of fact, that's uh, the airplane uh, that they, they gave the WASP program, and uh, they flew this aircraft around the country. On the far left of the picture is Paul Tibbetts, uh, who, of course, we'll talk about later in his uh, uh, actions with the B-29. But uh, that was a pretty, good, uh, a pretty good trick. I think it worked out. I could have used that inspiration on my first flight, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, when you really look at the airplane, well, you know, what's it like to transition into? I'm going to do my best to share with you some of my impressions and feelings and emotions and, and knowledge as, as I went and, and made that transition. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Um, so really, coming from a B-17, there's a few things that you assume, and some of them are right and some of them are wrong. Uh, this picture here gives you a little idea of the relative size difference. So you've got a B-17 here, and typically we're running overcast at 43 to 1,000 pounds, 103-foot wingspan, and uh, four engines, 1,200 horsepower, you know, nine-cylinder R1820s, Dash 97s, great motors, very reliable. Um, and typically in wartime, they ran them as high as 65,000 pounds. The G model had a gross weight of 65,000. So then you look at the B-29, 120,000 pound gross weight, 8,800 horsepower, 141 feet of wingspan. The propellers alone are 16 feet 7 inches in diameter. That's compared to the B-17 and a measly little 12 foot, uh, just a little over 12 feet, three blade prop. Um, a lot of the systems are the same. 
Uh, Boeing obviously carried an awful lot through from the 17 to the 29. It's all electric airplane. Anyone that's ever flown Boeing's as a, as a pro pilot knows that literally up through past like the 727, they stayed with the concept of elect electrical systems is the best way to go. Um, <clears throat> but just, just some of the, the key differences here is you climb in as a, a, a brand newbie in the airplane. Um, I put up here the, the, the basic dimensions. So, so you got, as I said, 11 foot, 7 inch diameter props, 21 feet to the center line of the outboard engine. On the B-29, almost 17 foot diameter propellers, and you have 31 feet to the center line of that outboard engine. With only 28 inches of clearance on the outboards, 14.1 inches of clearance on the inboards. So if you ever come to a, a smaller airport and you see either Dock or Fifi operating, oftentimes you'll see the outboards literally shut down and X'd. And the reason why is you can't have the outboard props running for fear of hitting something. That might take out a, a, a taxiway light or a runway sign or a hold short sign. And literally the procedure is to start all four, warm them up, shut, out the, shut down the outboards, taxi out, finish all your, your before takeoff, take the runway, and then start up the last two engines, make sure everything's ready, and then go. Um, it's just, it's a different approach. It's a much bigger airplane than the 17 uh, for, in many, many respects. So here it is on the ramp. This was actually taken, I think, two years ago down at Madison at Heavy Bomber Weekend. And this, this is a good perspective. You've got our beloved aluminum overcast and dock, and they're just both beautiful airplanes. But look at the relative size difference. This airplane is just massive compared to the B-17. There's a, a shot of Fuddy Duddy, actually. We operated Fuddy Duddy for almost two and a half years. And then there's, that's the, me and Doc bringing it to Air Venture. And uh, again, this was taken at their brand new facility in Wichita, looking down on the nose of the airplane. And it's just, it's a massive machine. You're, you're, you're looking at such a special piece of history, and you're just realizing this, this is a lot of airplane. There's a lot going on. So what's it like to fly? Well, again, I'm going to try to contrast it between the 17 and the 29. I look at the B-17, and it's, it's kind of a, a cozy. you got two people, and it's a two-crew airplane. You, we do have a crew chief on board uh, that helps with the, uh, the managing of the systems and whatnot, but really it's, it's two folks. you got a pilot flying and a pilot not flying. The B-29 is truly flight by committee. It's six people to fly this airplane. you got a pilot, you got a co-pilot, and you have a flight engineer. And then you have three train scanners in the back of the airplane. Those are all required crew via the operating limitations. You cannot turn a propeller with the intent to fly on that airplane unless you have all six crew members on board. The checklists are all integrated. So every position on that crew has a particular call out, a response, or an action based on each checklist um, challenge and response item. So when the pilot flying calls a particular item, the pilot not flying typically will respond or the engineer will respond. Oftentimes, for example, when you put the flaps to a particular position, pilot flying will say, okay, flaps set to 15. Pilot not flying will reach over and set the flaps to 15 in the center console. And then the scanner in the back will verify flaps verified 15 because they can see the flaps coming out on their tracks and there's little marks on the top of the flap body itself that tell you when it reaches that particular um, amount of, of deflection. So it, it really is a different kind of flying. Um, probably the most interesting aspect of that is, is an early three crew airplane. It's a very in flight engineer intensive airplane. So the flight engineer manages a lot. Of the, of the flying. Matter of fact, I was kidding all my B-17 guys when I came back after the first couple of, of trips on the airplane saying, really, I, I got to start the B-17? Isn't there somebody to do that? Because um, it is kind of neat when you get to the point of engine starting checklist and you basically hand it over to the engineer and wait till he's done. <laughs> it's like, wow, this is kind of nice. <clears throat> but um, you, you do get a cadence and a rhythm going. Um, I am so accustomed to a two crew B-17 that you're calling power settings and you're calling the various parts of the various checklists, particularly when you're inbound or outbound, um, and you're working together as just two, two folks. In the B-29, you gotta remember, it's not two, it's three, and in many cases, it's six. So I was, I was inbound, my, my son Ryan reminded me of this tonight at dinner. I was inbound on a flight in Wichita, it was a ride flight, and uh, this was last spring, and I was such in a good cadence, and we were, we were inbound to Wichita, we were gonna do, do the overhead brake, and I call, was calling various power settings, and the flight engineer is setting all the power. You don't touch it. You just, you're driving. Um, and, and I called, uh, as now, I called him by his first name, the flight engineer's name. And he's right in this picture. His name's Donnie. 
And I, I said, hey, Donnie, um, you know, manifold 2.6. And he'd set manifold 2.6. All right, Donnie, manifold 2.4. He'd set manifold 2.4. <laughs> but out of habit, I called, Donnie, flaps 15. And, and he went, I don't think I can reach it. Because <laughs> the flaps and the gear are up front. Actually, I think it was called, I called the gear down at that point. And he said, I don't think I can reach it. So the next flight, they come out with a broom handle. And they wrote on the broom handle, flight engineer gear extension tool. So, so that Donnie had a half a shot of being able to reach that gear switch. It, it's a different machine. It, you know, it really is a much more crew intensive airplane uh, in that respect, which makes it pretty special. So here's a good shot. Um, here again, B-17, two guys. You got your pilot not flying, backing you up on the throttles, and the pilot flying is manipulating the throttles. Here's the throttle quadrant on the B-17. It's actually a throttle quadrant out of one of the Boeing flying boats. It's the Boeing 314 flying boat that literally would hang down from the ceiling. That's all Boeing did. For years, people were like, where did Boeing come up with this odd arrangement with these four individual throttles that are kind of intertwined together? And we finally looked it up and found a picture of a Boeing 314 flying boat, and here they are hanging down from the top. So that's where they, they got it from. They never used it again. It, it was definitely a different arrangement. It's unique. But certainly when they got to the 29, they went to the four individual throttle levers, uh, one on the, uh, a set of four on the left and a set of four on the right. Um, and it, as I said, it, it's, it, it's a heavy engineer airplane with a guy basically sitting behind the co-pilot facing backwards, managing all of the power aspects. That's the other unique thing about it. So you're flying the airplane. You take the runway. You're going to walk the power up real carefully. And my first flight was a really eye-opener to me because you got, you know, these four 2,200-horsepower engines and massive propeller blades. And if you're too quick on adding the throttle, it's, it's, there's no nose wheel steering. It's a free castering nose wheel. So the first thing it does, it goes hard left. And you push down instinctively hard right on the rudder pedal, and nothing happens. And now it's heading for the weeds. And you're like, this isn't a good place to be. <laughs> So you try to walk up the outboard power on the side that is swerving, and all of a sudden that number one engine comes on pretty hard, and now it's going the other way. And you're thinking, wait a minute, this isn't a tail dragger. It's not supposed to be this hard. And if you eventually learn the technique is to just gently walk the throttles up and wait. Just get a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, and finally after it accelerates through about 70, the rudder will start to work. And now you've got enough rudder authority along with adverse yaw with ailerons to actually kind of keep it going down the middle of the runway. But the first couple of takeoffs, I'm like, doggone, this thing's worse than a tail dragger. <laughs> and and you, you figure it out, you know, but the first couple of times, it's a real eye-opener. I mean, it swerves hard left with all that torque and P-factor on all four of those massive engines. Um, at 70, when you know you've got it and your rudder's actually doing something, you should be somewhere pretty close to max power, which is 44 inches and the uh, hybrid engines that these 229s that fly, Fifi and Doc, have. So you call engineer max power engineer throttles. So now the flight engineer takes the throttles. It's like auto throttle. You watch all four knobs kind of go up all by themselves, and he's got it. So, and then you're just flying. And at 100, you rotate and accelerate very, very quickly um, to try to get the airplane to a much higher speed because below 150 is probably not going to fly straight if an outboard quits. Below 125, it's all over. Matter of fact, if you're below 125 and you lose one, your only procedure is to just abort. Wow. So the idea is to get to 190 as fast as you can so that you can get the best cooling of the engines because they really do need a lot of airflow to cool. So the rest of the flight, you're simply telling the engineer power settings and literally driving the thing, calling for gear, flaps, all the way down final into the flare. You might be all the way back to 20 or 18 inches of manifold pressure on what you've told the engineer to set. And then as you kind of reach that, that sweet spot to start the transition, you'll call the engineer, ease them off. And the engineer pulls the power back. You're still just driving. That's totally not the way you fly a B-17. <laughs> so that's different. That's very different. And then in the landing flare, you touch down, you hold the nose off, and gently set the nose down. And then as you're decelerating through about 70, you call pilot throttles. And then you take the throttles back and taxi off the runway with it. <laughs> totally different. Totally, it's, it's really a neat experience. Big transition from a B-17, it, though. It really is. <laughs> it really is. So here's a video we've got. And this is, this is all of you got to do with the engine start. When you finish the first series of checklists and you get to starting engines, that's when you say, okay, engineer, it's your airplane starting engine checklist. Let me know when you're done. We have, how do we get it to play, Chris? I think you just push on the middle uh, thing there and it should. There you go. 
There he is. Engineer starting number two. Lights off. At some point, he tells you guard that throttle and set it at a thousand. You'll just kind of watch it for him while he goes off and starts the remaining engines. So it's it's a whole another world of, of ops of operations. All right. So as I said, per, to me, coming from the B-17, I'd very, be very curious to hear what um, our B-29 veteran thinks about this too. Was I was shocked to see how little directional stability the airplane has on takeoff control. I mean, coming from the B-17, you're talking a 45,000 pound tailwheel airplane. It's a lot of work to keep a B-17 going straight, and you better be good at it. That ain't nothing compared to that darn nose wheel on the B-29 that's free, uh, free castering. It, it is as much work to keep going straight and will actually handle less of a crosswind than the B-17. I've flown the B-17 in as much as 20, 25 knots of direct crosswind. And through good use of ailerons for adverse yaw, through, through lots of, of differential thrust uh, to keep the airplane going straight and good pilot technique, you can handle that kind of crosswind. Anything above 15, game over in the 29. You do not tr push it uh, past that point because it just is so sensitive uh, to what the wind's doing to you on the runway. And obviously you've got a lot more distance out there too, so you very quickly can start to see outboard engines over runway lights and th places they don't want to be. So why did Boeing do this? That's a good question. I'd love to get a hold of a, an original Boeing engineer and ask him that. They obviously figured out their mistake because here's the C-97 cockpit. And what, anybody know what this is down here? It's a tiller. <laughs> they have nose wheel steering in that bugger. That's unfair. That's cheating. <laughs> They literally put nose wheel steering in the later variants, so they realized pretty quickly, probably ought to put a way to keep this thing going straight other than just letting that nose wheel flop around up front. And this is actually out of the E model uh, B-17 tech order, which I always thought, why doesn't that knucklehead lock the tail wheel? <laughs> well, why didn't they put nose wheel steering on the 29? <laughs> There are a lot of similarities. As I said before, you know, when you learn the airplanes and you learn the systems, you really are able to lean back on all the aspects of the B-17 that you know and, and are so familiar with. Um, things like the, and we saw it, uh, Chris mentioned back here, we've got a 56-inch smooth contour tire. Well, guess what? The same rim, the same tire, and the same brakes all are applicable to the B-17 and the B-29. If you look carefully, look at that rim, and look at that tire, and then look at the 29. The only difference is they put two, but it's the same identical brake assembly. You have 40 pucks on a drum assembly brake on the inboard side of the rim and the outboard side of the rim on both tires. And same thing with the G model. They put brakes on both sides of the G model, just single wheel instead of two. Anybody see anything wrong with the, uh, the picture here of Overcast? Oh, you're, you're not fair. He, Ryan's my son. He's going to know the answer. Look at the number two <laughs> propeller. It's actually feathered. We had a, an engine shut down on that flight for real and came back with one of them feathered, the dreaded three-engine approach. <laughs> uh, in the B-17, three engines, it's not a big deal. Uh, you literally bump up a little power and, and continue to fly the airplane. B-29 is also, in many respects, as long as you hold on to the energy, not that big of a deal with one engine out as far as return for landing. Two engines, that's a big deal. You're literally on the B-29 going to run 42 inches of manifold pressure on the inboard engine and 40 inches on the outboard, and that's it. And, and you better keep that airplane clean and manage your energy effectively. B-17 is not quite as critical. When you have two engines out on one side on the B-17, it's pretty manageable. As long as you hold on to about 120 miles per hour, it's very manageable. This is kind of a cool thing. Um, so I was telling Chris earlier, we, we've collected over the years... Um, many, many tech orders and military publications and even original Boeing publications. This is a whole collection of Boeing news. And Boeing had some pretty interesting information. It's kind of like aviation archaeology, where you learn by going back and relearning a lot of this information. So one of the key components on the landing gear is the uh, jack screw actuator assembly. It's an electrically driven jack screw, and it's what moves the landing gear on both the B-17 and the B-29. Here's actually a picture of one on our test rig over at the Weeks hangar. Here's the Bendix Eclipse motor that drives that. There's actually an original um, Boeing Field Service News that talks about if you have the wrong actuator as far as the drive key, from the B-17 to the B-29, because they were the same actuators. But if you had the wrong drive key, the B-29 drive key had a different dimension, and it would literally fall out of the B-17 actuator. 
And on Overcast one year, we actually experienced that. And we had a near emergency where our crew had to go through an entire procedure to get the, the left landing gear to extend. And we learned by going back and studying. We had a successful landing, no, no issues. Crew did a great job. But we certainly learned an awful lot about operating a B-17 in that landing gear system by going back and studying the original Boeing news and finding this article that said, hey, if you're running these, you know, the following serial number equipment, beware that this can happen. And it's, it's kind of like relearning the airplane. These guys back in the 40s knew this like the back of their hand. You know, those of us that operate these airplanes, it's relearning. It's aviation archaeology. Um, by the way, this, manu this uh, actuator is made by a company right here in Wisconsin, A.O. Smith. Does anybody know what A.O. Smith now makes today down in Milwaukee, Wisconsin? It's probably one in your basement. They make water heaters. <laughs> They're still in existence today. Not as glamorous as B-29, B-17 parts. No, but probably just as important <laughs> to most true. of us that need Especially hot water. right now, yeah. <laughs> so here's a picture of the hydraulic system, uh, the hydraulic gauge that's uh, pressure on the system. The one on the left is the B-17. Very, very identical system. The one on the right is the 29. Here's the flight engineer station, and this is the top of his panel. And then if you look here, the lower gauge is your main hydraulic system pressure, and then you have an, an emergency system pressure that's basically ganged with the main one. Um, so the difference is the B-17 is running 580 to 950, and it's cycling back and forth. If you've ever heard of B-17 taxing, you'll hear the squeal of the brakes, and you'll hear that, that electric motor running the hydraulics up to pressure and then kicking off, and then kicking back on and kicking off. I know Don must remember that vividly because it's something anyone who flies in these airplanes, you can't ever get it out of your head. You know that sound well, because it's a good sound. If, if you hear it, it's working. If you don't hear it, your mind starts to go, why am I not hearing that? And the B-29, it's the same system. The only difference is you're running 1,025 PSI to 1,225 PSI. So it's a little higher pressure, but otherwise it's identical in how it functions, how it's set up, how it works, the brakes, and believe me, brakes are important. Remember I said before, no steering. <laughs> brakes are your friend. All right, so if you talk about takeoff, let's kind of run through a little bit of the differences in takeoff. On the left, here's the B-17. Uh, we've talked about a little bit already. You know, it's a very careful walking up the throttles. You take the throttles in your hand, and you gently move them up. By the way, in the B-17, remember that funky arrangement that we said came from the Boeing Clipper? Well, you have to hold it upside down. You can't hold it like this. So you hold your hand upside down, and when you walk the throttles up, you twist your wrist, and you literally move them up, and you're, you're twisting your wrist upside down to help with directional control. When the airplane starts to go left, you're twisting like this. The airplane starts to go right, you're twisting like this. And eventually, you get them pretty close to max power, and you'll call max power, and your, your buddy next to you, your, your pilot not flying co-pilot, tr trims them and tweaks them up. Remember, on the B-29, you don't do that. B-29, you're walking those throttles up, and you're really going and stopping, going and stopping. Okay, it's going a little bit left, a little bit stop. Wait, stop. Okay, I'm at 70. Now my feet can actually do something. Max power, engineer throttles. And now the auto throttles kick in, the guy behind you. So on the B-17, you're going to rotate at 90 to 95, and then you're going to climb. Basically, you're going to get to about 130 to 140 and reduce to your, your uh, quiet climb or cruise climb. And then on the B-29, you're rotating at 100 to 110, very quick, 150, where you'll call climb one, flaps up, and of course your gear's up as soon as you break ground, positive rate. And then at 190, you'll go to climb two. So it's a much faster operation. There's a lot of things going on a lot quicker in the B-29 because of the speeds and the need for that cooling air to keep those engines where they need to be. Uh, so it's, it's, again, it's a different environment, but a lot of similarities too. So here's the, uh, the pattern and landing approach for both airplanes. You'll notice, again, on the 17, you're entering the pattern at about 130. Uh, gear down in a third flaps, 110 to 120 on base, and then you're 100 to 105 down short final. And really, 105 is, is, is the number. 110 is a comfort factor, and you're, you're scrubbing it off. You're bleeding it down to you know, 100 in the flare. Uh, the B-29 is exactly the opposite. You're coming into the pattern... You're doing it 190, 180. The gear speed and the initial flap speed on the B-29 is well above. Gear speed is 180, flaps are 220. So you got lots of speed to play with. You want to get that gear coming down at 180 and settle into the pattern at about 26 inches of manifold pressure. You're not going to get the airplane below 160 to 150 until you're literally on final because you're trying to hold on to that energy. You don't want to get the airplane slow out here. Energy is your friend. 
And as you basically are configuring the airplane with additional flaps to 25 on base, flaps to 35 on final, I actually stay at 35. Some guys go to 45. Uh, some guys stay at 35. I like how the airplane flares with a flaps 35 configuration in the flare. But you're holding on to that speed until you literally get really, really close. So a modern airline driver, a jet pilot, would say, well, that's not very stabilized. It's, it's a different kind of stabilization. You're not flying a constant speed all the way down final. You're literally managing your energy to preserve it to as close in as you can get so that by the time you are below the point of energy of really needing where you need to be for a go-around, if you would have a go-around, you're committed to land, and you're going to be landing at that point anyway. So it's a different philosophy. It's a different kind of flying, and it's quite fun. So basically 125 to 130 on short final, and then that's where you call the engineer, ease them off, and you just basically flare the airplane. Stu Dawson had it described best. He said it's like flying on the end of a two-by-four because, you know, you're way up front, you got all these different panes of glass giving you all different sight pictures. So the other thing, and Charlie Tillman describes this really well, he says it's like you're a boxer on short final. Your head's bobbed back and forth <laughs> trying to figure out which window I want to look through to get that sight picture because every one gives you a little different. Am I on center line or not? And, you know, you finally settle on it, but uh, it's, it's a little disconcerting at first. And then, you know, as you're flaring the airplane, you're literally flaring the 29, pulling back, pulling back, and you don't want to pull too much because if you pull too much flare, you can strike the tail. And if you, have to, if you strike the tail, your job is at the end of that flight to go back and sign it with a Sharpie, oh. and then you owe beers to everybody on the airplane. <laughs> so it's not a good thing to strike the tail. Um, 17 is, is a little different. The 17, you're going for the three-point touchdown. So as you're, you're pulling the power back. Horrible. You actually have to do that. <laughs> Um, you're pulling the power back, and you're flaring the airplane to the right sight picture so that right at the right height above the ground, all three wheels touch at the same time. That's an ideal B-17 landing. So there, there's a lot of similarities and a lot of differences and just a lot more mass and energy with the 29. I mean, you're flying, a, the 29's got 64 pounds per square foot of wing loading. Uh, that, that's a lot. That's a lot more than a, B, a lightly wing loaded B-17. Sight picture. This is kind of cool. Looking out the right window. Uh, they're a little different, but they're also both wonderful. I mean, when you look at the B-17, you've got these marvelous nacelles, cowl flaps right next to you. When you look at the 29, you kind of look back on the props. They're a bit behind you, uh, but it's huge. I mean, those huge propeller blades are out there doing their thing, and that wingtip is way out in the distance, and you're like, is it still connected? Yeah, that's, it is. Uh, pr pretty special sight picture looking out the window. This is another good shot. So this was taken in training. Uh, on the second training flight, they put those of us that had finished our training activities in the back with the scanner so that we could see more about what their jobs were and their roles and learn that. So as we're doing that, at, at one point, I decided to go all the way back in the tail. And I got in the tail gunner position. And during the, the stall series, you can see the, the flaps are deployed here and the flight crew up front is doing their... There are three stalls. First is clean configuration, then the next is takeoff configuration and a turn, and then the third is dirty or landing configuration straight ahead. And I'll tell you, this, is, this tail, it's a long way during a stall. When you feel that airplane start to buff it and shake, you're like, oh, I shouldn't be here. <laughs> this, is, this is pretty far back in the airplane. You, you're literally looking out the window right next to the hinge line of the elevator and the, uh, the horizontal stabilizer looking forward. This is also looking out at the back of the B-17. One of our crew chiefs took this, uh, looking at the waist gun on the left side uh, on base leg to final to a really big runway. That's 15,000 feet long. Does anybody recognize what that airfield is right there? That's Edwards Air Force Base. We were very blessed to be able to take our B-17 aluminum overcast into Edwards and fly the entire graduating class of the test pilot school out of Edwards, which was pretty amazing experience and, and an awesome place to be. And with the history alone there, Chris, we got to get you out there. It's, yeah. it's really something. I won't argue. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the combat operations that the B-29 uh, would go on. Uh, early on in, uh, uh, well, basically not long after the Doolittle Raid, uh, the President of the United States promised China that, again, American bombers would bomb Japan from China. And it was something that actually kind of led to the B-29 being rushed along, was the president had made this promise. He wanted to fulfill this promise. Um, the problem with it was is the Chinese bases were, were, they had the runway, but there wasn't any infrastructure. So 
B-29s, when we did get them, would actually have to haul their own fuel over the hump to their bases in China. And some of them would actually have their turrets removed along with B-24s and then the C-46 just to stockpile enough fuel to fly these missions. Uh, the B-29 did eventually bomb uh, uh, Japan from China. The president did hold his uh, word that we would launch uh, missions before the end of the war from there. Uh, that's uh, 29, uh, That's actually the first uh, 29 combat uh, operation in the Pacific there. Soon after, uh, one of the issues was they were saying that the high-altitude bombing wasn't exactly working the way they wanted to with the B-29 on specific targets in Japan. And uh, they turned over the B-29 operations to uh, a famous general, uh, Curtis LeMay. And uh, anybody who's a fan of the B-17 or B-29 or Strategic Air Command uh, certainly knows who this gentleman is. And, 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 I, and I love the history that he has to the B-17 as well. Yeah, he, he really does. He, he was a, a, a younger uh, officer in the late 1930s, and he's the gentleman that, that led the squadron of early sea model B-17s out to intercept the, the Italian ocean liner, the Rex. And it was really the first interception of its kind. To, it was 400 miles offshore. And these guys flew their B-17s out, found it, and did, of course, a, a, a hero pass past it. <laughs> and it actually caused the Navy to rally Congress to, to enact some law that pro pro prohibited the Army Air Corps from flying a certain distance past the shoreline because <laughs> it was Navy territory. Yeah. <laughs> Army-Navy, uh, that rivalry uh, still is going on. So. Uh, Curtis LeMay, of course, uh, tried a, uh, a few months of normal, what I would call high-altitude bombing missions. Um, the first B-29 uh, raid on Tokyo was led by this aircraft. Uh, this airplane is named Dauntless Dottie. Now, there's a couple things special about this picture. We've been talking about B-17s transitioning to B-29s. Um, a lot of people know Paul Tibbetts as the gentleman who flew the Enola Gay and dropped the atomic bomb. A lot of folks don't know that Paul Tibbetts actually led the first B-17 mission in Europe. Um, he doesn't really get any fame for that. You would think the first of something would become famous for it, um, but a lot of folks never really gave that any thought. He became famous for his B-29 operations, though. This B-29 led the first mission on Tokyo, and it was flown by a guy named Robert Morgan. Robert Morgan flew 25 missions in a B-17 called Memphis Bell. He became famous for his B-17 operations. He led this raid. Nobody really talks about it. <laughs> so... Uh, he was, uh, he never, so the Memphis Bell was named after a woman named Margaret Polk. Uh, Margaret Polk and him never married. They stayed lifelong friends. In the meantime, uh, when he got reassigned to the B-29, uh, actually he was, he was selected to B-29. He was given his choice of where he wanted to go. Uh, he saw B-29 once and said, that, that's where I want to go. Uh, he had married a girl named Dot. The airplane became Dauntless Dottie. He got to choose his bombardier from a pool of bombardiers, and he chose a guy by the name of Vince Evans which was his bombardier on Memphis Bell. So uh, they were reunited on this aircraft, and this is actually a, a picture of them getting ready to go uh, on that mission. After a, a short period of time, um, Paul, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, um, Curtis LeMay was uh, unconvinced that traditional high-altitude bombing uh, was working. So he had, some of his aircraft had turrets removed, uh, and they went in at low level. And rather than carrying some of the bombs like you see here, uh, they carried incendiary bombs. And their idea was is to, to start fires and really try to go in at low altitude on the deck. Uh, that's exactly what they did. On top of it, the winds around Japan, around Tokyo, picked up these fires. The combination of these fires and what basically most of the structure there was wood uh, basically leveled Tokyo. Um, here's a picture of Tokyo a few days after the fire raids uh, that they flew. You know, when you think about bomb load, Chris, this is a 500-pound, an example of what a 500-pound piece of ordnance looks like in, to scale. B-29 could carry 20 of those. B-17 on a good day was lucky to do uh, basically 6,000 pounds or 12 500 pieces of ordnance. And oftentimes the bomb bay wouldn't fit at all. Yeah. Uh, they really struggled. The, the 29 is just a massively bigger airplane. Well, something else we want to talk about is, is it's a special time that, that we're here. It was something we didn't realize. I wish we could say, we, boy, we planned all this months ago when we were uh, putting this together, but it was something we realized as we were putting this together. 
And that's that 75 years ago right now, the Battle of Iwo Jima was taking place. Uh, this was a, a long, hard-fought uh, battle to, to gain control of this island by the Marines. Uh, and, of course, there's the famous uh, flag raising that took place. But that battle 75 years ago is happening right now. Uh, why would this be important to the B-29 operations? Well, we wanted that airfield. We needed that airfield. That airfield became a safety net, an emergency field where B-29s could go to. Just a few days, literally like three days after we took the field and took over control of the airfield, a B-29 named Dynamite was damaged and had nowhere to go and knew of this airstrip and made an emergency landing on, on Iwo Jima. So all the lives that went into to, to gaining this piece of land, um, while that cost was high, it saved numerous airmen because now they had a place to land their B-29s when they were damaged. Now, Iwo was about halfway between Tinian, where uh, the, m the majority of the operations for B-29s were based, uh, and the targets in mainland Japan. And that first occurrence, there was still fighting going on. I mean, the Marines were still hard at it trying to secure the island. And literally, it was a major morale boost, I think, uh, from everything I've read, that as they were really struggling with, with the, the ferocity of the, you know, what the Japanese were, were like and fighting back, to see a crippled airplane actually come in successfully and, and save lives, uh, that meant a lot to them. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, uh, the B-29s would become uh, famous for ending the war. Uh, the two B-29s selected to drop atomic bombs were a Nola game boxcar, part of the silver plate program. I think both of these were uh, Baltimore-built aircraft, I, I, I think. Yeah, I mean, uh, probably the best nose art I've seen from the atomic uh, attachment to the B-29 was the uh, B-29 up and at him. Yeah. <laughs> I love yeah. that. So I'll, I'll tell you a brief story about Enola Gay. Um, we had a docent here uh, who you never know, I, and I always like to tell people, you never know who you're standing in line next to at the grocery store or, or who you're talking to, especially when you see a veteran's ball cap. They have a story, you know, and sometimes they're willing to share it. And we had a docent here who, the, the, as far into it as he would go, is he would say, well, I worked on B-29s out in the Pacific. And uh, we lost him a few years ago, and shortly afterwards his wife uh, said, well, I have some photos. Would you like a photo of him to, to have in the museum from when he was in, in a B-29 squadron? And we said, sure. And she brings out a picture, and he's changing spark plugs on Enola Gay out on Tinian. And uh, he never said a word about it, you know, and just kind of, just did his thing, but uh, both of those B-29s are preserved, the uh, boxcars in the Air Force Museum. That dropped the second atomic bomb on uh, Nagasaki. Uh, Nola Gay was on Hiroshima, that was the first. Um, again, uh, that, uh, I mean, it's a conversation you can have a lot of debate on about whether or not we should drop those bombs, but it ended a war. A lot of folks don't understand that if we were to invade mainland Japan, I think they were estimating a million losses to give you an idea of what the government was prepared for, because we weren't sure these bombs were going to work, we were preparing for that invasion. They started making Purple Hearts. And in order for what the military advisors said we would need and the, the amount of casualties we would have, those Purple Hearts, I believe, lasted through the Gulf War. I mean, so that gives you an idea of how long and how much of a nasty battle that would have been if we had to invade mainland Japan. Uh, so. It's not, uh, you know, flying, uh, flying uh, atomic missions isn't the greatest uh, thing, but at the end of the day, it also saved lives, and that's something that uh, is important to talk about. Also, interestingly enough, statistically, more people were actually lost in the Tokyo fire raids than were in both atomic missions. So uh, it's, it's a very uh, interesting uh, uh, deal. I will tell you that if you get to go to the Air Force Museum to see Boxcar or Air and Space Museum at uh, Udvar Hazy, um, it, it's def definitely powerful to stand near those airplanes. It, you get a chill. Now, what does it mean? Why is it important to keep these airplanes flying? And um, you, you've got two definite, definite advocates on stage for that. Uh, but I'll tell you a story. I was in membership services, and we got a call from uh, a young lady who said, my grandpa uh, was a B-29 uh, gunner. Um, we want to bring him into the show, but we also know that this is going to be pretty tough. Um, and... The call had come in, we talked about it, and we said there's got to be a way that, you know, he, he just wasn't uh, as mobile as he once was, and we were trying to figure out an easy way to get him out there. She said, all he wants to do is see a B-29 one more time. That's the whole point. Well, messages got uh, mixed up, uh, and they came early. They came a couple, like about a day before the show actually started. 
and uh, we're trying to figure out what to do with them. And I said, well, I'll go give you a tour. So we put them on a golf cart, and we take them for a tour of the Warbirds area and things like that. And to be honest with you, I'm stalling. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to break it to him that the B-29 isn't here yet. And uh, in the meantime, he starts sharing these amazing photos with us from his time in the Pacific. And he's got formation pictures uh, f flying uh, out over uh, their combat missions over the ocean. And then even when the war ended, he stayed. And they actually started helping liberate prisoner of war camps. And he had pictures from dropping food on uh, prisoners of war where they were uh, going to recover them. And, uh, and, Sean, this is where you get to be the hero of the day because as I'm trying to break it to him that uh, Doc isn't here, uh, Sean and uh, Doc actually appeared. Uh, and I got, I got to be hero for that day, too, because I'm like, oh, yeah, I planned this the whole time. It's dramatic. <laughs> you know, we'll wait and have you, you know, get to see it fly. It's pretty good. And, uh, but it worked out perfect. And, and he got to see it fly. The airplane landed, uh, got its stage on Boeing Plaza, and he got a really uh, a warm welcome by everybody out there and got reunited. He got to see his old airframe, and that, that's, that's all he cared about was getting out there to see his old airplane because that was, that was his mountain. He wanted to go check it out again. I can't tell you how many times I've literally almost been kicked out of the seat by, by vets. <laughs> that uh, It's such a special, warm thing to, to share and, 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 and be privileged to be part of. Uh, we had a, 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 an original B-29 navigator that came out to Wichita this last spring and went for a flight with us. And we put him, of course, in the correct navigator seat, which on the 29 is right up between the pilots, right in the middle of the glass. Um, and... During that flight, he shed 20 years like that. He was standing up or sitting up straight. He was into what was going on. You can almost see that he was right back to his routine. You know, when we got out to the, the end of the, the arc that we were flying and started to turn back and return to Wichita, it, he just had that look on his, his face of, all right, get me back home safely, boys. You know, it's, <laughs> I've done my job. Now time for you guys to do yours. It was, it's just such a special thing to share these pieces of history with younger generations and the greatest generation and, and be able to make that connection for people. And there's no way you can do that through a movie or through a DVD or through a textbook. There's great books out there. Don't get me wrong. There's great movies out there. But that living history flight of actually being in the airplane and, and hearing it and smelling it and seeing it, it's an impact unlike any other that tells that story. My, uh, my favorite story that I think I experienced was we had uh, a bombardier come through the Weeks hangar when uh, airplane the B-17 was here for maintenance. And uh, he had his family with him, including his, I believe, like a 15-year-old great-granddaughter. And we kind of let them have some time. They're up in the nose. I just went to check in on them, and grandpa, or great-grandpa, is laying on the floor in between... Um, sort of the bomb site and a control panel. His great-granddaughter sitting in the bombardier seat, his old seat, and he's going through the panel in the bomb site and showing her exactly what each thing did. And it's like, that's just so cool because you're getting to see your great-grandfather in probably a light that you've never seen him before. You know, there, there's so many stories like that and, and even more emotional ones. Uh, one that sticks out to me is I was down in Lakeland, Florida with the 17 and we were doing a tour stop and we had the press flight activity. And Chris, for years, has, has helped organize much of those press activities in such an impactful way. In this particular tour stop, uh, we had a, a, a veteran and then a daughter of a veteran that literally went on the flight with, with the press and with us. And at the end of the flight, we shut the airplane down and hopped out of the seat, and I'm walking back, as I usually do, and as I'm going through the radio room uh, and past the, uh, the waist gunner positions, I notice her literally just standing at the left waist gun position, and tears were rolling down her, her, her cheek. I asked her if she was okay. She said, yeah, I, I'm okay. And I said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some time, and when you come out, I'll, I'd like to chat with you a bit. She said, okay. So I went outside and gave her some private time, and she came outside the airplane and gave me a hug. And I asked her, so got to tell me, what, what, uh, what's going on? What, what caused these emotions? She says, well, my, my dad, um, she said, I was born in May of 1943, and my dad was killed in April of 43. And I never knew him, but this flight got me closer to what he was doing in service of his country than anything I've ever done. And it just overtook me emotionally. And I, that really stuck with me, to have that kind of a connection for a family member that she never knew her father, and yet that airplane helped get her closer to what her dad had done during some of the most impactful times of his life as a young man and gave his life for this country, that was pretty special. Wow, absolutely. And that, again, that just touches on why it's important to keep him flying. Um, 
I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight, uh, including our special guest. Uh, hopefully, he'll be willing to hang out and answer some questions. He didn't correct me on anything. I'm sure he's got a couple things I yeah, said he wrong. He hasn't thrown anything or anything yet. So, Sean, uh, as tradition, though, we are actually going to take questions, too. We have a mic on each side of the stage there. Um, before we do that, uh, you aren't getting to escape our tradition here. Uh, thank you for everything that you do to keep oh, these airplanes alive. We've got both and, our names uh, on it. Come on. Well, it's all right. That uh, Thank you so much for doing this with me and for, for just doing everything you do to keep these airplanes alive. Thanks, thank Chris. You. My pleasure. Appreciate it. Pretty neat. Well, let's get some good Q&A. You guys yeah. have to have some, some Anybody questions. have any questions? Come on up and hit a microphone here. Got one right here in the middle. Do we have a mic coming? Go ahead, chat it out. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, when you look at the wire looms and the massive amounts of white uh, aviation wire all over the inside of the airplane, uh, 10 miles is probably conservative. <laughs> Remember, it's all electric. Remember I said before, the airplane, all of the systems, cowl flaps, um, uh, the only thing that's not electric are the brakes themselves, because they're hydraulic, but they, even that has an electric pump that runs the, the pressure aspect of that. Flaps are electric, gears electric. So when you see the movie where somebody says, I, there I was in combat and my hydraulics were shot out and the B-17 or the B-29, the gear wouldn't come down, right away you got them nailed. That, they don't know the airplane. It's electric, they weren't hydraulic. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So we're up there with up and at them. I love it. <laughs> Sir. What did you think about uh, Connie when you met her? Uh, what did the Reverend Gallery tell you? Oh, uh, an amazing, amazing lady. This, this was somebody that li lives in Wichita and actually drove rivets on dock. And she will tell you and point them out to you exactly where they're at and which ones have been replaced. Uh, four foot something, <laughs> about eyeballs with the top of that 56 inch smooth contour tire back there. You didn't want to get in her way, Not <laughs> once, no, she, she bowled me over I think. She's just an amazing lady. And she actually still goes out and tours with the airplane. She was in Madison with us. And you know, she wears her Rosie the Riveter garb and just a wonderful human being, she's just a neat lady. Uh, to try to keep up with her, yeah, <laughs> yep. We have a question right over here. I have three part questions. First, when, what year? What was the year that the last one of these rolled off the production line? How many of them are still left flying? And what do you do for parts? All good questions. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. So I don't know the end production of the 29. I'll admit that we'll have to look that up. But I can tell you this: um, when you're talking about dock versus aluminum overcast, this is kind of funny. I was telling Chris this right before we got going tonight. Uh, DOC was built in March of 1945. It rolled out of the Wichita plant uh, as a straight B-29. Um, aluminum overcast, its serial number, was built uh, at the Lockheed Vega plant in, in California, Southern California, and it rolled out in May of 1945. So technically, the B-17's a newer airplane. <laughs> there are 26 B-29 airframes left in existence, 26 out of just under 4,000 produced. There are 53 B-17 airframes left out of 12,731 produced. So, and, and out of those B-29s, there are only two that are flyable. That's Fifi and Doc. On the B-17 community, there are eight that are flyable, um, Overcast being one of them. So both are rare, rare birds. And then parts, she asked. So it's like maintaining any vintage car you maintain it with parts by having parts. So if you haven't been over to Weeks Hangar, I'd encourage you to come over and do the next time we do an open house over there because we have walls and walls of original new old stock parts. And to some degree, same with Doc. They have done a great job of collecting things, and yet they're always on the hunt for important things. They do not, they have one spare propeller assembly. That's why we saw the picture of the, the manufacturing plant. Yeah, spare prop. First thing those guys uh, that maintain dock would go after and pull off that airframe. 
um, a, lot of, a lot of support. I mean, there's so many special elements. Uh, we had um, Jack Rapp from NASCAR and, and other folks like him that so much believe in these airplanes that they were literally throw their capabilities to produce things and use original drawings to produce exact replacement parts depending on what you need. So we're, we're very fortunate in the Warbird community to have the support elements that we do because you couldn't keep them flying without it. And you're talking about the, the massive amount of B-17 parts we have in storage. And uh, last year at AirVenture, uh, the C-47 came in that was flown by the guys from Buffalo. And I was really geeked out to go over and meet Buffalo Joe. And literally the first thing, the door comes down, Buffalo Joe gets out, and Mikey says, this is Chris, he works with EAA and the B-17. And I'm, I'm spooled up to ask him a bunch of ice pilot questions and stuff about Buffalo Airways. And the first thing I get is like, yeah, you're still using my B-17 parts? And like, I couldn't even get a word in edgewise. He was... <laughs> you know, that, I'll never forget that, because th that was a, an amazing, uh, we'll call it a barn find, although it's nor Northwest Territories find. Um, there was this lore of caches of original B-17 parts still left in existence, and they were literally plucked from the likes of Aero Union back in the mid-1980s, which was a firefighting company that operated a couple B-17 airframes. And uh, I, myself, along with Daryl Lenz at the time, some of you long-timers at EA may remember Daryl. He was our director of maintenance for a number of years. We reached out to Joe McBrien and literally were it was able to put, put together a deal that uh, he, he had for years held his original B-17 parts in the hope of getting, getting an airframe, because the B-17 was something he always had a special affliction for. And while he had DC-4s, C-46s, DC-3s, you know, all these wonderful warbirds, he never, ever acquired the, the infamous B-17. So he had two Quonson huts full of, of original new old stock parts. Uh, there were many attempts to try to get him to part with them over the years, and somehow EAA cracked the, the ice with them, literally. <laughs> um, and he, you know, he, he's, he's a neat guy. He really is a special individual, a die hard, died in the wool, lover of aviation, old school pilot, old school values. And he, he, he saw EAA had a lot of similar characteristics to how he viewed things. And we were able to put together a deal that he, he wound up, uh, providing a, through a donation and also a purchase all of those parts out of the B-17 cache that he had. And we sent up two 53-foot uh, uh, semis wow. to bring, I mean, everything from a complete horizontal stabilizer, a vertical stabilizer, um, flaps, cow flaps, um, brake assemblies, carburetors, turbochargers, uh, landing gear actuators, landing gear uh, struts left and right. I mean, just, just a massive quantity of uh, correct B-17 original parts. Wow. That's incredible. Yes, sir. I'm ready for you. That's why I brought this. <laughs> so this gentleman asked about uh, control surface movement. And that, so the yoke, if you don't know, the yoke on the B-17 is identical to the B-29. Remember, we talked about the cap earlier, right? And the fact the cap fits both, and uh, we found ours to be a 29 cap. Well, the other thing that's very unique is the difference in throw. When you first climb in the B-29 versus the B-17, so the B-17, you're sitting behind the yoke, and you go to full deflection on the aileron, and it goes about like that and hits the stop. Like, okay, that's a reasonable spot, comfortable human, you know, ergonomics, and I can do that from either direction. So you climb in the B-29, and you get it in your first crosswind, and you go to the stop, and it goes here, here, <laughs> there, it finally stops. That much more mechanical throw in the B-29 to get the leverage to deflect those controls. There's literally, if you, if, if you don't believe me, watch the videos on YouTube, you'll see it clearly. There's literally from that on the 17 to that on the 29 to get full aileron deflection. And remember, ailerons through adverse yaw are a big deal for directional control in both airplanes. So you're always deflecting those ailerons to help keep that airplane going straight when you're fighting a crosswind. So big difference, good question. Yes, sir. Oh, sure. Yeah, you, and you train for it every year. You do go-arounds. You would do three-engine go-arounds, uh, four-engine go-arounds, of course. Uh, it, it's all a question of, uh, again, staying ahead of the curve. 
and not getting yourself behind and slow. Um, as long as you're calling for power settings and cleaning the airplane up, uh, it goes around quite readily. Um, it, when it gets interesting is when you lose one and then lose two. Now you're really working at 42 and 40. Uh, and you better be cleaned on the airframe. Your gear better be up, your flaps better be up, and then you manage it from there and hold on to that speed. Do not get below 150. You've got to preserve that energy so that you've got good control authority and some ability to climb as well. And the B-17 uh, uh, go around, uh, even a two-engine go around, is as long as you're 300 feet or higher. And that's the, another thing you look at with both these airplanes. 300 feet and below, you're committed. You're committed to get the airplane on the ground because that's the safest outcome. Um, above 300 feet, though, then that's why you're holding on to that speed and you're not bleeding back below 150 down to your 125 to 127, 128, whatever your VREF is calculated at. Depends on your weight. Um, you're not bleeding down to that till you're down in that below 300-foot range, kind of in that final segment of, of final approach where you're committed to land. So it's, a, it's not that same stabilized. We're flying one ref all the way down. It's a different kind of approach in these warbirds. Yes, sir. Sir. Yeah, they, they did. As we talked about earlier, they had all kinds of teething troubles on the early. The initial prototype had a, a R3350-11, um, uh, Curtis Wright. And then the, the, um, the middle production levels had a dash 23. Doc and Fifi have a dash 95 engine arrangement. And that's truly a hybrid engine. They've got a different power section versus a different um, a nose case, and it, it, it's a very reliable engine. Uh, they, they, by the time they got to the, the technology of the late variants of the 3350, it was much, much more reliable. Um, Doc and Fifi basically operate with very few problems from an engine uh, failure standpoint, cylinder change standpoint. Uh, they've really sorted that out. Now, the props are set to a different pitch setting, um, and we're running a lower RPM. Uh, the original B-29s were running, um, I believe, 2,600 RPM. These are set to 2,400 RPM. They tried. Um, they, it got better, but it wasn't truly resolved until the, the, the very post-war variants of, of the motor, and you saw in the later Connies and whatnot, that those, uh, the, you know, they really got all the problems situated by then. But they were constantly working on sorting out the teething troubles and getting the engines to be more reliable. But you'll, you know, most crews that flew combat in the Pacific, they still dealt with engine problems all the way until 1945. And we were talking earlier that parts of the airplane's uh, engine were actually built with magnesium. Yeah, and as you know, magnesium burns, and it burns yeah. very hot, like 1,500 degrees. So once you, once you have a fire that's magnesium-based, your day is getting really, really bad really yeah. quick. Question back here. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay, we got it. Good. Man, we're good. <laughs> we got time for one last yeah, If you see thing. white smoke coming out of the, uh, the nacelle, it's a, you stay here, I'm going for help. <laughs> It was several hundred pounds. Uh, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but I do know that to, to not paint the airframe saved several hundred pounds. Um, Long-range crews, I mean, there's performance charts that you can consult, and it depends on the altitude, uh, you know, what you're pulling out of the engines. But we, we typically burn about 500 gallons the first hour and then 400 every hour after. And the airplanes, the, the, the current B-29s, Fifi and Doc, hold 5,460 gallons of gas when they're full. Um, wartime, with auxiliary tanks and Bombay tanks, they could take that all the way up to 9,000 gallons. So they had tremendous range in those airplanes. Compared to the, 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 the light twin B-17, if you will, um, obviously not. But the, the B-17 held 1,700 gallons with an additional 1,100 gallons called the Tokyo tanks in the outer wing panels at burning about 200 gallons an hour the first hour and 160 to 180 every hour thereafter. I think I, I saw a figure that said it was 700 pounds of paint. Is that right? I, it was something like it was, it was 700 pounds of paint, I think, that they were, they were saving uh, by stripping the paint off them. Tell you what, if I had to polish that airframe, I'd, <laughs> I'd take the 700, 700 pounds. pounds yeah. Well, again, thank you very much. Oh, we had one last question right here. 
a lot. <laughs> uh, I, I haven't heard the number on the 29. It's probably somewhere north of 2x. The B-17 currently is about 4,500 an hour. Um, so you're you're talking just under 10 grand an hour on the 29. Has got to be the number. I'm I'm guessing. Did you have a question there? That's right. He's reminded me of we, we have a nose gear from a B-29 out there as well, uh, as well as uh, some uh, artifacts from B-29s. And the de Havilland Mosquito is open tonight, so you can actually climb in uh, a, a World War II de Havilland Mosquito, which we've got to be the only place on Earth that will let you do that. So uh, if you haven't been, please... Uh, smells like a, a Triumph or an MG. Yes. It smells you haven't of, been in it. Climb in. It's just like a little British sports car. It's pretty awesome. It smells of rich mahogany, I always tell people. So... <laughs> Again, thank you all for coming out. If you have questions, please feel free to come on up. Thank you again to our honored guest back there. Without you, we'd be living in a much different world. So thank you so much for what you and your men did. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.